have us begin. Um, so tonight we've got uh, a couple of things and we actually didn't, didn't uh, narrow it down. We had our agenda meeting to say exactly what we were gonna be focusing on, but we do have a support staff request and a, and a flag policy discussion that are gonna be probably the uh, main focus of the meeting tonight. Um, and I need to have one of the members, I know we're remote, it makes it a little bit harder, but can I have someone uh, maybe raise their hand and say they'd be willing to just give us a little feedback at the end of the meeting on how our meeting went? Do I have a, a willing meeting evaluator? And in the packet of information, there is there is the, the little um, evaluation that you can refer to if you want to pull that up. Do we have a, a volunteer? This is Ashley. I'll do it. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Um, so that will be Ashley for tonight. And um, so we're going to roll right into um, public comment. Um, just as a um, reminder, um, Linda, who's taking notes, needs to know who's speaking. Um, so if you can please state your name uh, and your town or, or uh, your position, that would be helpful. And um, we're going to try and keep uh, the public comments per person to about three minutes. And uh, so we'll, I'll be trying to monitor that. Katja, if you can help me out on that, as well as um, other board members too, in terms of uh, just keeping track of who might want to speak, just because that's kind of hard to follow. Um, so I'm going to open up for public comment. And again, we're just listening. So um, if you have something new, that's great. If someone's already said something, um, just for efficiency purposes. Um, please don't repeat too much. All right. So do we have someone who would like to speak? Maybe raise your hand. All right, looks like Marie. Hi there, I guess I'll break the ice this evening. Um, I have a, just a few notes that I wrote down here that um, I would like to read. Um, my name is Marie Dunwoody. I work as a one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional at RES. Um, I've enjoyed working there for the past seven years, and I've been with the district for almost 14 years now. Um, and I have a little bit of a story, and I'll keep it really brief, and I have it written down, so it'll keep me on track. Um, I have a passion for working with children. Um, I enjoy working with educators. I love learning, being amongst friends, just like the kids. And uh, school is my source of income. Um, and when support staff sign their contracts, they are committing themselves to challenging work. Um, we are promised sick days, personal emergency days, family, sick time, vacation time. Um, and support staffs are negotiated for us by our district union reps um, who put in tireless hours because they know that their support staff um, and paras like myself um, are a vital component to the functioning of our schools. I recently was sick with COVID for two weeks. Two of these days fell on COVID snow days, January 13th and 14th. These two days were legitimately sick days for me. When catching up on my timesheet, I wrote 6.5 hours sick with COVID, added my hours, signed my timesheet, and submitted it. When looking at my last advice slip dated February 1st, something looked fishy to me. Um, and in thinking that um, the checks that I wrote the day before and dropped in the mail weren't going to be covered because I was short 13 hours. So I went back to my timesheet and it had been authored, deleting hours that I had typed in and I didn't receive a notifying email that I was being rejected from using that sick time. So this totally didn't make sense to me. School was closed for COVID. I'm homesick. Um, 
I don't know if anyone else um, had gotten sick with COVID, but you know how I felt. Um, denied 13 hours of sick time compensation for some outdated pre-pandemic rule. My scenario was already in motion before the COVID snow days um, were called. The decision did not make me feel rewarded or appreciated for all my years of dedication. These are tough times and it resonates in all of our heads. <clears throat> and if it doesn't, just step into the classroom, which most of us on tonight um, are in classrooms and you know how difficult it's been. I strongly feel myself and other support staff who are out sick with COVID on those COVID snow days or sick with COVID and have exhausted their sick days, that they should be compensated from another source. In conclusion, I feel my 13 sick hours are legitimate to use for those two COVID snow days that I was not able to attend school. Um, I feel closing school during a pandemic to me is not a snow day. Um, and that's my story. Um, that I would like to share. Um, I did not expect my paycheck to be short 13 hours. Um, and uh, it's, this is a pandemic issue. And I think whatever the rules may be, they need to be readdressed and changed to um, accommodate our pandemic times. Thank you. Okay, do we have someone else who'd like to speak? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. uh, Nora? I, I, I guess I would like to just ask a clarifying question. I think there are some people who would like to speak to the issue that's coming up later on the agenda. And I think folks are not sure if they should be speaking now or if they should be waiting. Okay, so clarification, this is public comment time and there is public comment um, allowed. Um, well, actually it's, the rules are that public comment is allowed when, um, if the board's gonna make a decision on something, which we are, but that's gonna be done during, um, during the executive session because it's a labor. But we're going to have a chance. I guess my question is, are, will people have a chance to speak to that issue? Um, under the support staff the support. request? Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, because I, it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. All right, because that's our agenda item, right? And we're not, right. I, I, would, I would say we could do that then. Um, but it means folks have to wait for us to get to that um, to get to that agenda item. So we have a few things to go through before we get there. So um, if folks don't want to wait, they could speak now. And if they don't mind waiting, we could have them speak uh, shortly after Elaine speaks to to that um, agenda item later on. Dana? Hi, everybody. I'm a special educator at RTCC and worked 11 years at the high school as a special educator and supervised over 13 different paraeducators in my time at Randolph. And I am here to advocate for us to sit down and come to an agreement tonight in order for our paraeducators to get paid. Um, we went off of an 11-day holiday where they didn't get a paycheck into a COVID unpaid. Um, and then we met with Lane and came up with some stipulations. And then when we put that out to the paraeducators through the union, they weren't happy with those stipulations for many reasons. So I hope that we could hear their stories and their experiences tonight. And then we had um, a half day, which got canceled for, for the paras to make it a full day. And then we had um, Martin Luther King Day off, and now we had today off. And many of my paraeducators um, don't feel comfortable speaking tonight, um, but they also can't live on the pay that they're getting right now. 
and need to use their sick time in order for them to live and buy groceries and in order for them to afford gas and oil right now. And, it, and we are in the, these times where it's, it is really hard for them. I, I had one pair crying to me that she couldn't feed her family of five. I had another pair say that she doesn't drive anywhere because she can't afford gas. I had another pair say that she's looking um, for another job because she can't afford to, um, to work for us. And I had another pair quit last week because they got a five day a week job that paid them more than we paid. And they were my pair I depended on doing geometry and biology and all the math and sciences went into the classroom. Like um, we're really struggling right now. So I need you to take this into consideration um, laying in the board um, and just, we have to come up with an agreement because we're gonna lose some really dedicated um, workers that care about their students and care about their parents and care about our school. And I'm really afraid. Lisa. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm also speaking on behalf of my daughter. She works um, as a pair as a para one-on-one -on -one, um, at the school. She is a single mom. So when we had to close for those two days as COVID snow days, um, it was, it's really hard. It was really hard for her. Um, she depends on that money. She buys her groceries. She does her shopping and she takes care of her own son. Um, and as for me, I don't depend on my husband's check. So when I have to end up not working because the school decides that it needs to close because of COVID, which I understand, but at the same time, I didn't ask not to be able to work. And that, that gives me, I, that takes away from my pay. So then I can't buy, I can't get gas. I can't buy groceries. And that's what I basically use my check for is to do that. Um, I realize that COVID is really hard at this time, but I love my job with all my kids, but it just makes it difficult in wanting to stay because you don't get the pay that you feel that, you know, that you deserve. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, do we have any other folks who'd like to speak at this time? Hey, uh, Ann, this is Brian. Yeah. Um, I just had a, somebody asked me a question over here. Uh -huh. Um, over this last week, and I just thought it was probably the, the spot to put it out there, but it's probably really towards Lane. The um, person asked me about if the district had any plans of putting the mural back up in the uh, gymnasium. Kind of, they were under the assumption that it was going to be done in the design of the original ghost of it, and he was. They were wondering if there was any uh, plans on putting that back up. Okay. I think, uh, my understanding the question should actually be um, put to Lisa and Katie. I know that they've been working on it. I know that they've acquired an artist um, okay. Okay. to actually do the work, but they will have the details. Okay. I will. If I hear about it, I'll uh, push to him to, uh, to talk to them. Yeah. Thanks, Lane. Thanks, Brian. Do we have any other comments at this time? Tev? I, I just want to say that I saw both Marie and Deb Chamberlain raise their hands earlier, and I, I'm not sure if either of them wanted to speak. If they don't, I do also have something 
to share, but I wanted to give them a chance to go first. Okay, Marie or Deb? Um, I just wanted to comment that I'm sorry if I spoke out of time. <laughs> I don't have an agenda in front of me. And um, sorry if I just jumped in with two feet with um, with my little story. So I was just wanted to clarify that. Sorry. That's, that's fine. Deb? There. I kept clicking my mic. Um, I think I'm just going to hold off when we come onto the agenda and okay. bring it up at that point. Thank you. Okay. All right. So seeing no other comments or please flag your hand really fast if you want to speak. Otherwise, we're going to move on um to um a short discussion about um just new board uh member orientation because we are going into an election season in march and we're going to have a couple of new board members and um i wanted to check in with the board to to just uh think about sort of what what happens currently a number of you all came in recently as new board members and um i'm just thinking about as we have some potential new board members coming in what might be helpful um to go over um especially since some of you um are still fairly new and a couple of you are retiring off the board. And as you think about how we operate and what we do, if you have suggestions of things that might be helpful for us to think about to have in place for orienting new, new members as they come on board. So I was gonna give us um, a little bit of time to kind of uh, brainstorm some ideas or, or just have a little discussion about that. I have um, a couple ideas about that. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful um, for the new board members and even me <laughs> as being here almost a year, um, just to go over what happens in three years, like in the three year term. Because uh -huh. I know that there are um, like negotiations that happens every couple years, like big ones or every three years or or like what it's going to look like for the yeah. next three years um, and what that process looks like. And that would be helpful. I think a uh -huh. little explanation of what policy governance is because mm -hmm. not everybody knows what that is and how that works. Um, the do's and don'ts of the board meetings and the roles of people as board yeah. members. But I do think a meeting is a really good idea to do that. Did and I don't know how that has to happen, if it has to happen in executive session or if it can be separate from this meeting, because there's a lot to do in these meetings, it would right. seem like that could be its own separate thing, but I don't know how that would work. Right. So we, we, yeah, we should find out if it, I mean, if it's just a board orientation meeting, but if we have a quorum, do we have to warn it and all of that? So just finding out the legalities of how we might do that if it's just sort of helping to orient someone if that yeah all of that so just find out the the rules it seems like it, and if it's this is rachel mm -hmm. it seems like yeah. if that was done um in a special meeting and done publicly and warned that would be potentially beneficial for anyone who wants to know how our board works um, uh -huh. not just for our new members So that would be your suggestion. That's the, yeah, that's an idea. Uh, 
Um, any any other ideas for that? Is there are there a couple of board members who would like to be involved maybe in and again we have to be careful about how we because uh, we can't if we had like a, a committee working on what we want to do for orientation. I have a question for you, Linda. In the in the in the office, do we have like a packet of stuff that goes out to new board members? I think there's a pretty old packet. We should definitely review it. Um, anyway, I, yeah, and I'm sure some of the stuff doesn't apply anymore, and some of it probably is not in there that should be in there. So if we could review that, that would be okay. Yeah, I think it's. I don't even think it was Lane that did. Maybe it was Lane, but it would be when he was first here. It might have even been when Brent was here that that packet uh -huh. was put together. Okay, so, and we are in February, so we have our March organizational meeting, so, and that will be with the new board people, um, so, uh, and like, perhaps we should have thought this through in terms of maybe um, having having a committee to maybe work on this together and come back with kind of a plan do we do we have some folks on the board that might want to work together to maybe get something together work with what linda has in the office and what do we think about that would that be worth it or And are you, this is Rachel again, are you asking if, well, are I'm you one, asking for, are you asking for volunteers who would, who would kind of develop the, or, the orientation for the new board members? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then bring it to us and present it. Yeah. And then we'd need to, yeah. Move on at next meeting. Yeah. 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 Cause time keeps flying by. Um, so I'm wondering if there are a couple of people that might, might be interested in in working on that. I could do that. It's Rachel again. Okay. Um, I would be willing to help you out as well. Um, Chelsea, would you be willing to just sort of, especially as a newer person having come on, to kind of guide that a little? Um, yeah, sure, I can do that. Okay. Uh, so we so we probably need to um, ha have a motion to have Rachel, Chelsea, and I work on creating an orientation packet and process to present to the board in March for new board members. So moved. This is Katja. Second it. Uh, we got a second from Chelsea. Any discussion on that? Is, is this creating a subcommittee? Yeah. So then if we meet, we need to warn our meetings. I don't believe so. Not a, a subcommittee. I think it, you know, as long as you don't have the majority of your board. You don't have a quorum. So for you guys, that would be fine. And the reality is, is um, part of it is in um, establishing what the charge is for the committee, what you're expecting them to do, because all they're doing is bringing that recommendation back to the board for the board to consider. Um, and it would be the full board that would vote on it. Right, we're not acting on the board's behalf. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. 
Okay, so all those in favor of having uh, Rachel, Chelsea, and I uh, work together to create uh, a new board orientation packet and, and a process for uh, new board member orientation, please say aye. Aye. Okay, looks like it passed, Linda. Okay, so moving on to the next agenda item. Um, Linda, we just were wondering, because you've been in contact with the, with the um, town clerks, who we've got um, running for yep. positions. Um, the, actually, the ballots came today, so I'll be distributing them to the town clerks. Um, we're doing it through the tabulator again this year because of COVID. Um, we have Anne running for one of the Randolph um, three-year positions. We have Sarah Hopped uh, running for the other three-year Randolph position. Brookfield did not um, have somebody that made the deadline, although I hear that a Devin Cropley is interested. He'll have to be a write-in person. Uh, because he did not have his things in. There is a thing he can um, actually uh, write to the Secretary of State um, to ask to have the deadline extended. That's a COVID thing that came up. Um, I don't know if he'll do that. Um, he has to have 30 votes, write-in votes, um, or 1% of the voting population in order to be elected. But I don't think 30 votes would be too hard to get if he wants to run. So... Um, Anyway, okay. Thank you very much. So, mm -hmm. and I reached out to De uh, Devin, and I sent him some things. Um, we didn't quite coordinate uh, a phone call, but I did send him some information about from the VSBA about what does it mean to be a board member, um, and some policy governance uh, information and our board policies. Um, and I've left it open to him to to reach out to me he has my phone number um, if he'd like to follow up with a phone call. So good. Yeah. He just um, wanted hopefully, a little more info. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully um, maybe he'll, he'll take us up on it. We'll, we'll have to see. Um, and Brian, do you, have you been in touch with any, anyone, any, any, no. Okay. I All haven't right. heard from anybody that, would be willing to. I've mentioned it to everyone I see, but no okay. one wants to jump in. Oh, great. All right. Well, it's tough. I think it's tough for a lot of people. Uh, I think people are are uh, a little stressed out in uh, many ways. So, all right. So moving on. Wait, I just um, have, wait. I oh, just yes, one, Chelsea. One question about that. What do we do if there's not another person? Just there isn't another person um well there there are uh rules about how so if someone if we can find someone um there there are rules where we have to have um we have to have them sort of looked at by the select board of the town and and sort of they sort of Lane, is it that they're doing an approval or they just sort of say, okay, that, that would be all right, or? They've altered it a little bit um, during the COVID piece, but uh, what, what we've gotten at this point in time is that you can appoint someone um, if you have someone that's interested, but one of the requirements is that they have to, we have to hear from the select board, um, you know, as kind of an advisory. Um, and so that's an important component of that. So as long as the select board has uh, is able to talk to our board about how they feel about it, then our board makes the final decision. Okay. My understanding. I'm going to make a recommendation, um, just because we've got um, Pietro here, and I know that we've also got the folks here um, that are waiting for the um, support staff um, request. Um, to maybe put things a little bit of out of order, maybe to jump ahead um, to section four um, to, and then go back to section three um, afterwards. It would take a motion by the board to do that. But I think if we've got folks here to, to value their time, um, that might be worthwhile. 
Okay, so in order to do that, I believe we have to have a motion, right? Um, so does someone want to make that motion? He moved. Okay, Second. so Katya, Katya Evans moves and Brian Baker seconds. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. We're all good. It looks like it's unanimous. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move on uh, to the support staff request. So, Lane, you were going to explain to us sort of what what's um, taking place and what's going on. Yeah, I'll uh, I can try to at least provide a little bit of background. I'll try not to be too long-winded. Um, the district, I, I think, is, is most of the folks in the district know the district had to have a number of what we call these COVID snow days. Um, and they happened because um, either we were going to be below the 50% threshold in terms of student attendance, or we weren't going to have enough staff on those days to safely operate. And these all occurred during the um, Omicron um, surge, you know, that, that we experienced um, in the last three weeks. Um, the big thing is that the, since the support staff are hourly employees, it means that they are unpaid on those days. Um, you know, on the one hand, um, the days are generally made up at the end of the year, so their overall pay doesn't change. But on the other hand, it makes it incredibly difficult for them to be able to manage their finances um, because uh, these days when they hit, it's kind of unpredictable when they're going to occur. Um, they did ask me um, to meet with me um, to kind of come up with some ideas about being able to use sick time um, to be able to cover these uh, COVID uh, snow days. And I was able to pull together a plan from those discussions um, for the board that I felt comfortable recommending um, in order to try to assist the support staff. Um, in essence, it allows the support staff to use sick time to be paid for COVID snow days. Um, in the union, I give them a lot of credit. The teachers kind of stepped up to the plate and suggested that it was possible um, that the professional teaching staff might be willing to donate um, time from their sick bank to cover any sick leave used for this purpose. Um, just to kind of outline where we're at um, in terms of our COVID snow days so far, um, they happened in January during that Omicron surge. Um, and the number of days was different depending upon the school and what was happening in each school. Um, RUHS, RTCC, and uh, Randolph Elementary each missed four days um, due to COVID. Uh, Braintree and Brookfield each missed two days. So kind of a, a synopsis. And Lane, so um, and and what are you are you um, are you willing to work with? So what it, what exactly is the proposal? What or we can't talk about that until we go into the executive session. Um, you could, I think, for deliberation about whether the board wants to you know accept the recommendation or other ideas that folks, um, you know, if, when it's opened up to talk with the union um, to consider. Uh, but the basic recommendation, I had provided an outline um, for the board. Basically, I can read it for you. I know it's hard when we're all meeting remotely, but support staff may use sick time or personal days to be compensated on days when school is canceled because of COVID. Support staff may use the professional sick bank um, if they have exhausted available paid time off, um, exclusive of vacation time. Support staff will not need to donate any days to the sick, sick bank. If it is depleted, the regular procedure is laid out and the professional staff CBA will be followed. None of these provisions shall be construed as precedent setting under any conditions, nor may this agreement be used to establish past practice. So that's kind of what, what we're looking at. Okay, and that's what you and the support staff so far have have sort of agreed upon. Is that correct? Like I said, they they weren't um, legitimately so. They weren't in, in agreement with um, everything that you know I was thinking. 
Um, so, but what I tried to do was pull something together that at this board meeting, I could go to the board and say, you know what, I can wholeheartedly recommend this. Okay. Um, that was the purpose of this at this point in time. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so it looks like we have some comment. Um, I see Laura has her hand up. It's actually Nora, sorry. I mean, Nora, sorry. <laughs> no, I know it's confusing. I'm reading, I realized, reading the name on. <laughs> yeah. I realized after I joined that I was on Laura's um, account, and so it's her name there. <laughs> Sorry. So sorry about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, and it, they're so similar. So um, I just want to to clarify a couple of things. So um, I think Lane, Lane gave a really good summary of kind of how things came about. The, the union does have a slightly different proposal and um, in terms of, of what we're, we're looking for. Um, because there's, a, there's just a, there's a couple of issues that we were I disagree on and and so i'm happy to, i can put the link in the chat to um our proposal and i can read off and or highlight what the differences are on um, between the two if that works for everybody yes i think that would work i don't have chat is not available oh. <laughs> i can't put it in the chat <laughs> but uh, the big big thing is we usually shut that off because in a normal meeting people wouldn't be talking in the background. Uh, sure. See if you can do see if you can do it now normal. Oh, there Nora. we go. Okay. There is the link. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. You can shut it off now if you want. <laughs> um, that should get you everybody to it. Um, and I'm going there myself just so I can have it in front of me. So um, I think Lane, Lane is, we're in agreement that um, the professional staff is willing to have the support staff use the sick bank if they don't have any sick um, or personal higher emergency time left. Um, that doesn't include their vacation time. Um, support staff, um, we're proposing that they use their sick time for any of the school closures. Um, or for if they run out of sick time, um, that they would have access to that um, sick bank. And, uh, and the reasoning behind this is there were, um, there are some support staff who currently do not have any sick time left. And the reason that they don't have sick time left is because at the beginning of the year when we had to quarantine for 10 days, in some cases, they had to quarantine. In some cases, there, I think, I believe there were support staff that had to quarantine a couple of times um, and they were not sick, but they couldn't come to work until they had the negative COVID test. So they now no longer have sick time. So our concern is that if a support staff person then gets ill um, and they don't have any access, they don't have any days that they can use, um, even though they had to use their sick time previously, because during when they weren't sick. Um, does that, I'm hoping that's clear. I feel like I'm not being very articulate tonight. <laughs> um, the other thing is that the, the date, um, I think in Lane's proposal, he would like it to end April 15th. Um, we're proposing that this go to the end of the year. And the reason for that is that, again, somebody could get ill, um, in April, um, and then you, because they had to use all of their sick time up previously, either for th these COVID snow days or for quarantining, um, or because they were sick, now they have no days left. And because of the pandemic, they might have had to use more days than normal. Um, it's unusual circumstances. So we agree this should be non-precedent setting. We're, we're not trying to negotiate the number of sick days um, for the future, but this year, given the unusual circumstances, we feel like we sh they should have the same access to a sick bank um, as the professional staff does. Um, I think, I'm trying to go through and make sure, um, those were the two, I think, really big differences um, between the two proposals. 
Okay. So Ashley, you had your hand up. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. So can I, can we ask questions right now? I mm -hmm. guess just logistically. Yeah. Okay. So I have a few questions. Um, so the sick time, does that accrue and roll over year to year for the support staff? Yes, it does. But we have a lot of new support staff, people who have had, who don't have a lot of time accumulated. And how much um, is, and I, I just don't, I'm sorry, I don't know this. Um, how much do, so there's sick time and there's personal time for each support staff member? Correct. And Deb could probably speak better to the number of days because she's more familiar with the support staff contra contract. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her. <laughs> when we start off, I believe it's 15 days um, of sick time. It is um, three personal emergency days. And for people that are starting is one vacation day. The vacation day is not, you don't have to use this according to what Lane is saying. And he put that it's not us having to use our vacation day first before we use anything else up. Um, typically emergency days are used for snow days like today and maybe tomorrow. Um, but yes, I think the big thing is that the folks that do not have any sick time left that you know have just started and have used it because as nora said that we've been quarantined or they've been sick or they've been sick with something else but were told in the beginning that they needed to take a longer time because of COVID, even though they were tested negative because some of their symptoms were the same. Okay, so Deb, it's 15 sick days, three personal days, and then one vacation day when you start. Okay, Correct. and then um, this idea of a sick bank, um, does that exist for the support staff right now or only no. for the teachers? Only for the professional staff. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. thank there you. There's a differentiation between, you know, how many days a, a full year, um, person gets as opposed to a school year. Most of our folks are school year, which are in the, the range that, that Deb is talking about. Correct. Um, so I, I guess could I, if I could add just a couple more quick comments, I think there there's two issues. Well, three, three kind of big points I wanna make one. First one is um, we, well, we would really like to, to settle this item tonight. I wanna to make it clear that there are some other issues that are still outstanding in terms of a side agreement or MOU that um, we're not discussing tonight. And I'm not proposing that we do discuss those tonight, but I just wanna make it clear that this is separate. Um, there are still some other unresolved issues. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that there's two issues that we're trying to address in this particular side agreement. The one is the these COVID snow days. Um, and the other is the fact that um, there are people who don't have any sick time left, support staff who do not have any sick time left. Now that because they don't have any sick time left, that impacts them during these COVID snow days as well. But it's, it is somewhat of a different issue um, because the primary reason that they don't have that time left, any of those sick days, those 15 days, is because of the COVID um, pandemic and having to quarantine um, earlier in the year. Does that, I hope that makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to just mention is that um, I think Lane is correct that that there's a big issue when you're, when you're on such a tight budget, when your salary is, is I'll say as low as, as many of the support staff have and you're trying to make ends meet and you go through a period of time as Dana, I think really clearly articulated with the story she was telling from people who she works with um, and is supervising that you, your budget is so tight that you're having to choose between do I pay the rent or do I buy food? And now I have 
you know, four more days without pay, that that is a major problem. Um, those days may not, in fact, be get made up at the end of the year. It may not come out in the wash in, in terms of at the end of the year because if my understanding is, is that a waiver can be applied for, and if schools were closed because of staffing shortages, I think it's highly likely that that waiver will get granted. If a waiver is granted, those days will not be made up. So it's not like we're paying people extra um, that they isn't already in the budget for um, their salaries. Okay. I see, uh, Deb, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, I guess, and making clear the point about the folks that are either close to being done sick time or already out of it, is that if it's having to be used for these COVID snow days, what are they supposed to do come April, May? if they just, you know, get a really bad sore throat or get the regular flu or or get COVID again. Um, it's not just about getting paid for those days. It's that, as people have said, people are using their time for having to be quarantined and, um, you know, that leaves everybody short. So I, I totally agree. I've talked to many folks that are in this position um and it's a challenge when they're having to make a decision because we love our job we love our kids we wouldn't be doing it now you know our pay is not great especially for folks that are new and um kind of broke my heart when i heard from dana that somebody has gotten done but i totally understand that and i have heard from people that are you know questioning whether they should um so anyways but i also have a letter i have you know we talked to people about the meeting but yes some people are uncomfortable about sharing so i have something from a member i just like to read um she says i took a job at ossd with the understanding that i could earn x amount of sick time x amount of pe time personal emergency time. At this time, we are now being forced to use up those banks of promised time due to unprecedented COVID situation. A few months back, due to what I had known was a sinus affection, I was told to leave school, sacrifice my bank of sick time, and come back when I was tested. The loss of multiple days. Personally, I feel I may need, I'm sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on. I may need my sick time due to a multiple of medical issues. Because I'm a frequently ill, I have now been forced to use my sick time in ways that I have not anticipated. And which brings a feeling of insecure, insecurity about my employment. Due to Due to my low rate of pay, I already have taken a second job, which is actually why she is not able to be on this meeting tonight, because she's at work. Um, further deductions in our pay and our work days and or benefit use only exasperates my situation. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Deb. Uh, Tim? Yes, hi. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make one point about the idea of, um, you know, these days will be made up at the end of the year. Uh, as actually Deb just mentioned, one of our um, uh, uh, hourly workers um, has to have a second job even during the school year. Uh, I think many of them uh, have second jobs that begin as soon as the school year is over. So this is a loss of earning opportunity um, to people who are being paid by the hour and sometimes not that much. Um, this, this idea, so I just wanted to answer the idea that these days will be made up at the end of the school year. Uh, many of them might have other jobs that they have to postpone 
so that they can do these obligated days. Uh, Marie? Hello, good evening. My camera is not working for some reason. Um, I have some statements from uh, support staff that aren't able to be here this evening um, that I would like to read. I'm a special educator at RES. Um, support staff are already not paid much per hour and do not have as many hours to use during the week. The past couple of months have been difficult financially because of the lack of uh, the, the days off. The past couple of months have been difficult financially because of the lack of consideration towards pay for support staff, particularly those who have run out of sick days due to the pandemic. We had a one and a half week break, Martin Luther King Day, half day, on top of all of the unexpected COVID snow days. This creates much further financial stress for staff support who are not salaried. Responding to, the, to concerns of staff who do not feel safe or financially secure at the school due to COVID with use your sick days off or if you quit sooner then you'll have to pay it back makes me feel like I am not valued at a time where we have an unprecedented number of staff quit since the pandemic started. Frankly, I was hoping for a response that shows gratitude to the support staff who are important key players in fostering the educational and growth and development of youth that need the extra support giving incentives to us to stay in an unsafe environment, high COVID contraction risk, and to continue to do the difficult emotional labor of helping students pass their cor courses, catch up and deal with their mental health challenges at an unprecedented time is the least that can and should be done if the school administration values the labor that support staff provide and want to keep them. It is a disservice to the community as a whole to not value support staff by giving them additional pay for COVID snow days rather than forcing them to use their sick days during a pandemic. There are staff and teachers that have been quitting left and right from the past couple of years because of the lack of incentive and financial support necessary to make them feel like they can work here. There are other opportunities for jobs that are safer, consistent in pay and pay more, but I decided to go to the school because I care about the students telling me I'll have to pay back money if I quit only makes me feel unvalued and more motivated to find employment elsewhere with higher, more consistent pay and safer conditions. I strongly urge you to use the relief funds existent to pay staff, support staff, snow day pay for every COVID snow day that occurs or to find a way for support staff to have financial stability. Um, I feel that there should be money in the budget somewhere, somehow, to pay all support staff for days that we personally don't ask to take off. If we are all under contract to be here for a certain amount of days anyway, then why is this a, a thing? Last year, there were many days we were remote and we still got paid. In the beginning of last year, support staff were still getting paid even if they were not able or willing to come into stool, school. Um, and then another quote, as a para, no one can typically give me an answer about how to submit timesheets. So I think I have used the P&D section when we were forced to close. At one point, I was also forced to leave school due to what I knew was a sinus infection, told to quarantine and get a COVID test. This resulted in more time lost. Paras also lost time um, for the half day on Friday that was canceled. Um, and lack of pay from the holidays. The situation is very upsetting and I'm grateful to the help of the community through GoFundMe, but disappointed that they were made to do the job of picking up this slack. This situation is greatly affecting my decision process as I think about whether to return to OSSD next year. If my contribution is not valued to the point that uh, that is that they are fighting against my ability to pay my rent and survive, that I may need to find a new workplace where I feel respected and I do not have to live with the constant anxiety of never knowing what my paycheck will be from one week to the next. Forcing us to use our personal emergency days first is unacceptable. Um, there are a couple, of, a couple of more. I think it is completely unfair to ask staff members to use their contract, secured personal time, sick time, emergency days for school closures that they personally did not have illness or emergencies or plan to take those days off. We only get so many times off during the school year. We should decide when we get to use that time. Um, as a support staff, I, felt, I feel that under the circumstances, 
we should be paid. It was beyond our control that COVID hit the schools and had to close. Why are we using up our sick time and personal time when we might need it later? We are already underpaid for the jobs that we do. I used my personal emergency time so I could get paid, plus use sick time once those hours ran out. I would love to just be able to use straight sick time and not have to use up all of my personal emergency time to be able to get paid when schools are closed. We are overextended, and last week I had direct exposure to COVID five days in a row. It's a miracle I've not caught it yet. We deserve better. The district should have our backs better than this. We are taking chances with our health every day. Support staff should be supported through these times or we will lose our excellent people to other jobs. Okay, thank you very much, Marie. Um, Tev, do, can you make it fairly uh, short and concise? I can try to stay in my three minutes. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I wanted to speak a little bit as a classroom teacher. I teach at the high school. I'm a social studies and English teacher. And um, just to like the, the work of our support staff and paraeducators, I'm going to speak mostly about paraeducators because that's who I work most closely with. Um, but, you know, the, these are folks who work with kind of by definition, the, the students who need the most support, who are often the hardest to work with, who, you know, and, and that can look a variety of ways. Um, and um, I think that in, in my experience, these are people who, although they are sort of regarded as, you know, as, as the term support staff suggests, you know, auxiliary, extra, um, they're not, they're integral. Um, and I could not do my job without having the one-on-one -on -one paraeducators for the students who need them. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, folks like the ladies who work in the main office who are, you know, Lisa Jacobs is like covering people's classes because we can't find enough subs. Um, and, you know, on top of a zillion other things. Right. So I, I, I just I don't know that I, I don't want to make assumptions that that folks know the jobs that these people do. Um, and as a lot of people observe, the, the pay is not great. You know, it's between 14 and Sixteen dollars an hour, I think, is basically the range. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. No, it's, is it higher than that, Lynn? I, I think folks, most of the folks that are here are twenty dollars and above. Starting salaries are in the in the fifteen in the range that you're talking about, but most of the people that are here are twenty and above. Okay, so but but I think the starting salary is, is relevant here, um, and I think you know I, I just observe is the starting salary that is technically a living wage for somebody with no kids, um, but far below that. And we're not here to negotiate the salary, but I think the context is really important as people have pointed out. Um, I also think it's important to understand that during the pandemic, because of the lack of the ability to get subs, right, which is clearly a, a structural issue, our paraeducators have, have been the glue holding our schools together. These people have subbed for my classes numerous times while they are somehow simultaneously providing IEP mandated services to students on IEPs. Um, they're also, as far as I'm concerned, the experts when I'm trying to figure out how to accommodate students with special needs in the general population of my classes and how to meet their needs. Um, I think because of the turmoil this year, often what that's looked like is them helping me to create an alternative curriculum for students who, you know, who, you know, be, because we're a small school and, and shorthanded, we're, we're trying to meet everybody's needs with what we got. Um, and I think, you know, something that I think does not get recognized enough is that special education, I'm sorry, that um, support staff are often the people who come from the communities, sometimes literally the families that our students come from. That's usually not true of people like me, right? Like, and, and, and that's, you know, most of the professional staff, I think, not that we don't have a close and respectful and, you know, deep connection with our students, but um, we don't talk the way that the people in their house talk in a lot of cases. We don't, have that that connection but you know who does our support staff and that means that again for some of the toughest the kids for whom school is the toughest you know getting through the day is the toughest thing in their lives 
the support staff in our in our building, and again, I'm especially going to raise up our paraeducators, are the folks who, who who connect with those kids and who are, I think, in a lot of cases, the most significant adult, you know, outside of their family in, in their lives. Um, so, and I think as you heard in some of the comments that Marie spoke, a lot of them feel really disrespected right now. Um, I, you know, I, I think um, that I, I want to be honest, it has been a longstanding thing. You know, I think you talk to any paraeducator support staff in any school, they're going to say they feel like second class citizens. I think anyone who's worked in a school will, will know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think in, in this instance, for the reasons that have been articulated, a lot of people feel really wounded. And I'm worried about our ability to do the work for our kids, especially our neediest kids, without those people giving it their all, which somehow so many of them still are. And there's a lot of support staff, as, as Lane observed, who have been in, in our district um, for a lot longer um, you know, than, than me. And it's true that those people are not earning $15 an hour. They're earning a better wage. Um, but it's not just, but I guess I, I want to lift up that it's not just about the money. It's not just about the idea that like we don't want anybody to miss meals um, because of a snow day or a school vacation, which obviously we don't. But we want these people to feel respected and like they're equal partners in educating our children because they are. And if we don't make them feel that way, um, then they'll leave and go work at Shaw's and, you know, make more money. And that's that's a real shame because like I, I've got so much respect for these folks. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I hope I wasn't too long. Thanks. OK, Lane. Um... I think a um, couple of things here. I think we were kind of off the topic a little bit. You know, my, my recommendation tonight was an attempt to fast track a solution um, because the support staff had approached me with a, a, a problem. So I figured we might be able to have a fast consideration by the board and turn this around for them. Right now, it's really starting to feel a little bit like folks are trying to use this as a labor negotiation session, which is not what this is about. That's not what this forum is for. So at this point in time, I am withdrawing my recommendation to the board, and I'm gonna to suggest to the support staff that you make an official request to the board um, for negotiations and see if the board will entertain that. Okay. Uh, at this point, I guess, uh, Laura, I'm gonna give you like, uh, Laura, really Nora. Fast. That's Nora, right. like one minute and maybe one. uh I can Dana, do it. one minute and then and then we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on. I can do it in 30 seconds. I want to make it clear. We are not trying to negotiate a new contract. We are not trying to negotiate anything except for what we have put into our proposal, which is the use of sick days for um snow days and the use of the sick bank for support staff if they run out of sick time. That is what we're trying to do this year due to circumstances in COVID. And that is all we are trying to do. The stories okay. tonight were to point that out, the reason why it's needed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dana, same yeah. thing. Can you keep it real quick? Like. Sure. I'm just asking for them to reconsider. The reason why I talked tonight was to prove a point of where it's detrimental to our district if they don't get paid that we're not going to have our support staff and I cannot do my job if I don't have my paraeducators. And the fact that this is going to be taken off the table because someone read what paras wanted and because Ted and Nora talked, I never wanted this to be a negotiation. I just want my parents to get what they deserve. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lane, your hand is still up. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't put it back up. I apologize. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to close off our discussion of this. Um, we still are going to have an executive uh, session. So we'll we may be talking about this a little bit more, but it's going to be an executive session. Uh, so we're going to move on. Unless, uh, do any board members have any questions before we go? I don't want to say anything. OK. 
Okay, so we're gonna move on to the flag policy um, discussion. And um, Pietro, you're gonna explain to us um, what, what possibilities we have as a district in terms of creating a district flag policy. Yeah, so, Anne, do you want me to talk now, or is this something that you're going to do in executive session? Because typically, legal advice is given in executive session. Um, well, I, I was under the understanding that you were going to sort of present a possible policy or two, and the board could ask questions, but is that so that's something that we are supposed to do in executive session, not in a public session? Well, so, so look, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to tell everybody about the law having to do with flags, um, and that, that, that's fine. But if you're asking me to give you legal advice, uh, there will be no attorney-client privilege if I'm doing it in open session. Okay. Um, so, board... How do we want to um, manage this discussion? Do we want to move it to executive session or do we want to have some public discussion about um, just understanding the the legalities of flag flying? Um, just so that the public can can hear that um, and then we can move into executive session to get guidance from Pietro. Um, what would we like to do as a board? Do we need to make a motion. Uh, we need to decide what we want to. We, we need to decide what we want to do, so we can have some discussion about what we might want to do if we want to have a pub, just a public discussion about the legalities of flag flying, and then if we want to maybe move into an executive session to get advice or guidance on what we should do as a. So, so as Anne. A, let, let yeah. me give you a suggestion. The way I've done it with most boards is that I, I meet in executive session with the board and discuss the, 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 you know, the potential areas where there might be litigation and exposure for the district in connection with any practice or policy having to do with flags. Um, and then the board can, in open session, without me, talk about you know what their feelings are in terms of what we ought to do and why you think you ought to do it. You don't need me for that. And that's okay. a fully totally appropriate public conversation, right? The, but but the you know the part about where I tell you you know where are the areas where you can run into trouble and what you need to be careful of so that you don't get sued or you don't get put into a situation where you have to do things you don't want to do. I'd prefer to do that in executive session. Okay, understood. So I make a motion that we go into executive session with our legal counsel to discuss the flag. The potential flag policy. I'll second that, Katja. Okay, that's seconded by Katja. Uh, all those in favor say aye. <laughs> Saying aye. Okay, so we will head into executive session um, to get legal advice. So, Ann, I, I don't know. I don't have a link for executive session. Could somebody send that to me? I just emailed it. Um, when, I, when I get into executive session, I'll also shoot you an invite from in there. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. We are back. Um, and we are going to um, be having a... Uh, on the agenda next, uh, at the next meeting of a draft flag policy that folks will be able to see and give some public comment on. Um, and so now I'm gonna move us back to, um, actually back to, it was section three of the agenda that we um, moved away from. So, um, 
Lane, that you were going to fill us in on the um, student behavior plan collaboration and staff training. Yeah, so um, hopefully discuss about this and we can close it out. Um, what this was about was that during our regular special education audit by the Agency of Education, um, we were asked to create two components as part of our special education documentation. One was how we collaborate with the community, and the second one was how we're going to train contracted workers to ensure that they promote a positive learning environment um, for students. Um, the problem was is none of this was clear, and so when we questioned the Agency of Education on this requirement and asked them for details, um, they weren't able to provide us with any. They weren't able to provide us with any examples. And so I ended up reaching out to, to Heather Lynn, um, District Council, um, to have them connect with the AOE to see if uh, her expertise would be useful in trying to get out of them what it was they were looking for. Um, what the AOE did was they came back and said, no, you, you're, you're in compliance. Um, they said, as long as the board has a policy in place, um, that says that we're going to follow the agency's special education manual, then we're good to go. And I presented that policy to the board in October of this past year, and you guys adopted it in November. It's policy D7, and it's been immediately um, added to our policy manual, and it was immediately put up on the website. So we are covered, and there is nothing currently more that we need to do. And I'll put in this nice little humorous aside here is that the AOE has not yet developed and published their manual. <laughs> that we're supposed to be following. So hopefully that will be coming out soon. But we are we are covered. We can take this off the agenda um, for the future. Okay, great. And then we have the first review of financial conditions and asset protection. And uh, board rem members, remember you can go down to the central office to see that evidence and. Um, and read through and just look at the interpretation and make sure you're feeling like it's a reasonable interpretation. So do you wanna talk about them at all, Lane? Um, uh, policy 2.6, I should say a few words. Um, 2.3, just general for folks that are watching. Um, EL policy 2.3 kind of relates to financial conditions and activities. Probably the best way to describe it is that um, in general, it's making sure that we're ensuring that we're using monies for the intended purposes, right? We, we set out what the purpose is when we create the budget and it's making sure that we're using it for that. It's also making sure that we're paying our bills on times and that we're collecting any monies that are owed to the district. And so I do report compliance um, at this time. Um, on that policy. Policy 2.6 um, is about ensuring that the district's tangible and fixed assets are protected. Um, tangible assets are like cash. Um, fixed assets are like our buildings, um, you know, our vehicles, uh, you know, equipment, anything, in, anything that we own in, in that sort of term. Um, one of the things that I'm going to point the board to look at between now and the next meeting is that um, to review provision five. Um, when the board wrote that provision, it was written in a way um, that it was designed to ensure that the district was following the law by going out to bid on any projects um, and purchases that were over $15,000. The board put that in there as far as I can tell, because that's what the law says. Um, but the law has recently changed this past year, and the bidding threshold is now $40,000 um, when using our budget funds and $50,000 if we're using federal funds. So my interpretation has always been that we follow the law in terms of bidding. Um, so I'm recommending to the board that it either changes its policy so that the dollar amounts reflect the new bidding thresholds or reject my interpretation and say, no, we feel more secure with it staying at 15,000. Um, so that's that's worth taking a look at in between the two. Um, based upon the interpretations that, that are in there, I, I do report compliance on that. Um. <clears throat> okay, next up is the, the uh, COVID operating plan, and that um, is uh, for us to um, just feel comfortable in terms of your communication with us and what's going on, and also um, just... Uh, the global 
executive constraint, I believe, is the other policy that falls under. So how how I yeah. looked at it. Looks like you've made a few changes following the guidance that you've gotten from. Yeah, we it's um, the the only things that are in there when that changes. Um, the guidance is either from the CDC, which is then interpreted by the Agency of Education, the Vermont Department of Health. So that guidance is always added. Um, the only other place that it comes from is the Vermont Principals Association because they oversee athletics. Um, and so they put out guidance in terms of, of what they expect us to do in terms of athletics. Um, last major update to this occurred <laughs> kind of right in the middle of our Omicron surge that we were experiencing in the district. Um, and the plan was updated on January 17th. Um, basically, the changes um, that went in there, they shifted the responsibility for the test to stay program that we were using from the district on to parents. Um, prior to the guidance changes, you know, the kids would show up in the morning. You know, we'd, we'd run the tests for them. If they tested negative, they were allowed to school. If they weren't, they, they went home. Um, at this point in time, what the major shift is, is that those test kits go home with the parents. The parents test them at home. And if it's negative, they don't report it to us. They just send the kid kid into school. Um, I think the biggest piece, um, especially because there's a, a, a significant health component attached to this, that parents should be aware of, um, and that has to do with athletics. Um, and it's this idea that if an athlete does test positive for COVID, so this isn't for close contacts, this is an athlete that is actually tested poly, uh, positive, the league rules are that they must be cleared by a doctor before they can return to play. And there's a, a reason for this. Um, infection with the virus um, has an impact sometimes on cardiac function. And so the purpose of this rule is to keep the students in, safe and ensure that they're ready for the stresses that returning to their sport is going to place on their bodies. So that's why that's in there. There were some questions that came up in that, um, but, that but that's why that's there. And that is the actual policy from the VPA, which they pulled from um, Department of Health. So those are the, those are the major ones at, at this point in time. Uh, financial report is on there as well. Um, we are six months into the 2021-22 school year because um, our fiscal years run differently than every other business on the planet. Um, and that means we should have spent about half of our overall budget at this point in time. Uh, but because of federal reimbursements that we've been receiving uh, and the inability to hire some staff, um, we've got some open positions. We are well in the black in terms of the budget. Um, we've only expended about 40% of it so far. Um, there is a, a line on there that I'm going to check with our special education team that jumped out at me when I was reviewing things. Not that there's anything wrong with it, um, but we have a support service line that we have always appear to spend more than we budget for um, when I look back for year to year. So figure out why that is. And then the appropriate thing in terms of transparency is just making sure we're budgeting for what we actually need. Um, so I'll talk with them about that. My guess is it's just probably due to the difficulty in predicting, you know, what students are going to move in and out of the district that have high needs. But other than that, the the financials look really, really well. Um, same thing with the tech center finances um, at this point in time. Board members, any questions on on the financial reports? Okay, moving on then. Uh, we need to, I'm moving to uh, the consent agenda. So that's uh, minutes from the last meeting. And um, uh, Lane, did you go ahead and approve the maternity leave? Is that still so on this, the uh, this is a board approval um, one, um, and I'm happy to recommend approval of it. Okay. Um, this is a request. Um, the teacher wants to extend her maternity leave beyond um, the normal leave time. Um, so she'd like, it's going to pretty much start at the beginning of next year, her FMLA time. Um, when that wow. runs out, she wants to be able to stay out um, through the remainder of the first semester. Um, and so I, I do recommend that the board board adopt that. I can't go into more details because it's it's a medical. Yeah. Yep. So um, I'm going to have us uh, approve this uh, consent agenda as a whole. So can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda from a board member, please? I move so to approve the consent I agenda. 
Okay. Mrs. Hannah, Hannah. Hannah is moving to um, approve. And Brian, are you going to second? I'll second. And Brian's seconding. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye or show a hand. Okay, beautiful. Okay, uh, next we have our superintendent's report um, and the principal's reports. Any, um, any questions for Lane on any of those? Seeing none. Um, I'm just going to recap. So, uh, Chelsea, Rachel, and I are going to um, hopefully get together. We'll we'll send out an email to um, work on an orientation packet. Um, Pietro is going to be drafting a, a flag policy for the board to consider in the next meeting. Um, and we will be going into an executive session to deal with the labor agreement after this uh, this portion of this meeting. Um, and then meeting evaluation was Ashley. It was me. So I don't have a form, so I'm just going to kind of give my opinion on sure. a few things. Um, I would say that we were um, respectful of conversation this evening um, and with the majority of folks uh, participating. Um, while we definitely deviated away from the agenda, um, I felt like it was out of respect for our um, those that joined us in order to hear uh, them participate as well, to hear all the conversation. Um, so we didn't do a great job on following our time on the agenda, but I think it was uh, for good reason. Um, and I thought that basically it was a, a again, a culture of respect of hearing um, what folks had to say and responding appropriately. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so now, Tev, I, I see you have a hand up, um, but because we are a little bit behind schedule and um, we have heard a lot, I'm, I'm going to continue on. And I just can, have can you keep it to 30 people. seconds or, oh, you have a question. Well, I, I guess a, a lot of us are on, I think, because we're expecting that maybe come out of executive session, you, you all are going to make some sort of decision on the issue that a lot of people came to was, was that incorrect that was incorrect because we haven't had the executive session on that issue yet we just we we didn't realize that we needed the legal advice to be done through executive sessions so we're now going to go into executive session on the i see um, so okay so we should stick, we agreement. should stick around for that is that yeah what people who are sticking around for that okay I just wanted to yeah, ask that. Sorry question. about that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. I, I thought you were uh, wrapping up. Sorry. To, no, no, no. We're moving into that executive session uh, now. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. So we'll be back. Well, I oh. move to enter executive, de executive oh, session right. at 17 to discuss uh, what's on the agenda under executive session, which is labor agreement with the support staff. Okay. Do we have a I second? Second. Second by Ashley. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Let's head out and we'll be back. Looks like it. Um, so after careful consideration of, of the two proposals, do we have a motion from the board as to what we want to do? Do I have a motion from someone on the board? Can you guys hear me? I think you uh, went out there for a little bit. And, oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'll make the motion that we approve the um, agreement between, or the proposed uh, temporary agreement between the uh, district and the union proposed by Lane. Do we have a second? I'll second. This is Megan. Okay. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And it looks like the motion passes. So again, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We really appreciate our support staff and we appreciate our professional staff um, supporting our, um, our support staff. Uh, so do I see one? Do I see Tim Moynihan? Did you want to say one last thing? No, no, I'm just asking, um, was that the same the this one is the one that was uh, copied into the chat at one point earlier. No, no, it this is the one that um, was in our board packet um, that was drafted by Lane and the support staff together. Okay, I I just don't know if that's exactly what I'm looking at. Is there any chance that you could copy that into the chat, please? Uh, Lane, or do you, can you do that? Or just share out. Oh, Lane, you're you're um, you're muted. Uh, Tim, I can if you give me a few minutes, I can probably email it directly to you. Sure thing. That sounds fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So that uh, that concludes our meeting. Um, so do we have someone who wants to uh, make a motion to adjourn? I'm right, right? That was everything. I make oh. the motion that we, this is Brian, I make the motion that we adjourn. Okay. Uh, Laura, did you, or Nora, <laughs> did you have a quick question? Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to stop the meeting from ending, and I, I can ask you afterwards. I, it's procedure question. Okay. So go ahead and, and end, and then I'm happy to stay on and talk for just a moment. Okay, sure. Um, all right, so Brian uh, made a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second All those that. Seconded and by Katya. Yeah. And Dana's hand is up as well. Oh, Dana, did you have a quick question? Well, I could ask afterwards. I could ask afterwards too, but I'm wondering about the sick bank because that wasn't part of if people run out of sick time, if they could use the sick bank and I, I could stop and ask after everybody could get off if they need to get off. Cause I know it's been a long meeting and I appreciate all of you to listen to us and hear us. So I thank you for um, being here and being yeah. a part of this, but I would like to. Um, Lane, are you gonna, are you, you're gonna send that, that, yep. that agreement out to folks? So I'm also I'm sending it right it. off to Tim. Nora has a copy that I sent uh, a week or so ago. Okay. I'm just trying to find it. And... Okay. All right. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting, say aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a long night. We did well. And a couple of Nora, do you you wanted to ask a couple of questions? Yeah. So. I, I'm going to confess, and, and and I don't know if anybody knows the answers to all of this, but the, I've never done negotiations like this um, before. And and I, it's my understanding to for side agreement. I don't really know how it works. I guess is my question. And and so I I assume that so the board is voting on on Lane's proposal, but there was. It, was it, was, Nora, it wasn't a negotiation. You guys came to me with a problem. What I tried okay. to do, what I tried to do, and maybe it was an error, but I, ch I did check in with legal counsel. I tried to take as much of what people wanted and put it in there that I thought was going to be acceptable to folks and tried to fast track it because we were trying to get people paid because they missed a bunch of days. I was trying to get it in front of the board so the board could uh, approve it and say yes, and then you guys could approve it, and then we could just get it done and get people paid. That was right, the point. right, right, right. I I know I I get that and I appreciate that. That's that's um, again, but to to do a side agreement. Well, I I think at this point the membership has to vote. True. And and I and I. Okay, I just trying to trying to figure figure it out, um, but but because of you're saying it's not negotiations, um, 
yeah i'm just let's let's talk tomorrow when i'm fresh <laughs> yeah no i mean my understanding is you guys could vote for it or you could reject it and then the ball is in your court you know what path you want to take next Right. So I'm because I guess because there wasn't negotiations, there wasn't an ability to come up with a compromise between what you proposed and what we proposed. No one asked for negoti negotiations. It, you do have the right to do that. Right. We were just trying to solve a problem was my understanding in the process. People came to me and said, hey, can we sit down and talk about this and try to figure this out? Lane, I. That was my understanding as well. One one thing that for me muddies the waters a little bit is that the initial proposal that we received from you, which is admittedly is different from the proposal that you. Yeah, I adapted more were, of what you guys wanted. Right. Which, right. which but, yeah. but there, there was a provision in the initial proposal that was asking for people who left uh, before. That the was removed. Year. I, I know. But I think the fact that that was in there and that that was what we initially took to our membership felt to people like I, I don't know i mean it, 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 it like like was like that wasn't a, a negotiation tactic like I, I guess that was confusing to us is what I'm, what i'm trying to yeah. say and i think you know i'm just not, not like, sure the question to have i'll answer what i can if you can get specific um, i think yeah maybe nora you can do a better job of, yeah. of our no no i i just say, say i think i think at this point i just got to we got to kind of go back to the to the executive board i mean we got to put this out to the membership is what i i think we have to do and then they're voting yes or no on on this um proposal I could i ask a question lane what um changed from the original and then it went to the Oliver, please stop. What changed from the original that we discussed in our meeting and then when the board got it, they came back, they came up with the writing and what has changed? Because I'm really confused right now. Uh, All I, I want is for the parents. Again, I, yeah, so. I've been trying to email it out, but I can't do it while I'm talking, but I'll read it for you. Okay. So um, basically, like I had told, told Lauren, I told folks I was going to run it past Pietro. Um, to just make sure that, you know, either side isn't inadvertently putting in something there that we didn't intend or that might surprise us all later. Um, and so what we came up with, um, Orange Southwest School District and the Orange Southwest Education Association agreed to the following terms. Um, this agreement is in effect beginning on January 10th and following approval by both parties and expires at midnight on April 15th. So that piece is still in there. Um, support there staff may use sick time or personal days to be compensated on days when school is canceled because of COVID. Support staff may use the professional staff sick bank if they have exhausted available paid time off exclusive of vacation time. Support staff will not need to donate any days to the sick bank. If it is depleted, the regular procedures is laid out and the professional staff CBA will be followed. None of these provisions shall be construed as precedent setting under any conditions, nor may this agreement be used to establish past practice. And that's the entirety of it. So it, it incorporated the two pieces together, the ability to use the sick leave for um, COVID, um, as well as the idea that, that the support staff, not the support staff, professional staff who were so gracious in presenting was this idea of being able to use the sick bank. So it combined those two. Okay, thank you for the clarity because I was like, what is going on? I didn't know what, what we were adapting and what wasn't. So, okay, thanks. Yeah. Like I said, Nora, I'll send this to you too. Again. Well, yeah, I have it, but that's Here. okay. Yeah, send it to me again. Then it'll be higher up in my email. <laughs> before any more discussion takes place, I just want to be really careful here, Anne, because we did adjourn the meeting. So if this is like a yeah. meeting that Ryan is having with his staff, no, that's no, no. That's 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 fine. I I really just needed clarification. So, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Good night.